Ironically, I wrote the script for this video while in severe pain. I threw my back out while shoveling snow, whilst being in Canada. You would think that after almost two decades shoveling snow in Canada, your body would evolve in such a way that you could manage the task over the course of many winters, but no. Not for me. Anyways, it was a weird blessing in disguise because I could use the pain I was in to inform the words I typed. Before I found myself in a state of inescapable pain, I actively avoided writing the script for this video. I did want to talk about the relation between autism and how it amplifies pain, but in order to speak accurately and articulately on the subject, I would need to meditate on my life's most painful experiences. This can be traumatic for anybody, even for the average person. For autistic people like me, who have an inbuilt proclivity to be hypersensitive, it can lead to the most unimaginably dreadful outcomes. Now that my body and mind have been unwillingly placed in this state, thanks to Canadian winter, I figured it was the most appropriate time to take on this challenge. It is a challenge for obvious reasons, as well as not so obvious reasons. I must be careful not to let my emotions take precedence and lead me to say something either inaccurate or stupid. I have a responsibility to not only validate the experiences of fellow autistics, but to advocate on their behalf to members of their family or their friends, to let them know that everything I am about to say is true and not exaggerated. Pain is what one experiences when encountering something unknown or unconscious. It's a natural part of life. For as Aristotle said, there is no learning without pain. It is what orients us. It distinguishes between that which is conducive to our health and that which is not. In most cases, pain is manageable. When we feel pain, we take stock of what causes it, then we categorize it, and then we learn from it so we may avoid it in the future. However, as we all know, there are times when pain becomes so overwhelming, so unmanageable, that it loses that educational utility. It no longer orients us towards the good. In fact, it will put us in direct opposition to everything good, compromising our ability to think or act rationally, transforming us from civilized human beings into wrathful beasts. Just like autism, manageable or unmanageable pain exists on a spectrum of intensity and is relative to each individual. Generally speaking, however, neurotypicals tend to experience manageable pain the majority of the time and unmanageable pain every once in a while. In the majority of cases, the opposition to manageable pain is either non-existent or minimal, like when we're at work or doing a household chore. There is a lack of sensitivity to these normal, everyday stressors. As for times when neurotypicals experience unmanageable pain, they will understandably put up every conceivable mental and physical barrier there is to avoid experiencing it again. They will become hyper-conscious of it in the same way a mother bird becomes hyper-conscious of protecting her eggs after a snake tries to eat them. But keep in mind, regardless of whether or not the pain is manageable or unmanageable, both are a normal part of life, and we deal with it. Now, let's say hypothetically that of all the pain a neurotypical person experiences, 80% of it is manageable and 20% is unmanageable. That's a rough estimate. Now, what would it be like for the average person with autism? In the worst case scenarios, I'd say it's the exact reverse making 80% of one's pain unmanageable. The key factor behind this reversal is our inbuilt hypersensitivity. Hypersensitivity is what one thinks of immediately after the word autism is uttered, in the same way that one thinks of the band Earth, Wind & Fire when September 21st rolls around. It is this feature that separates us from the rest of the human population. What might be mundane to the neurotypical, like the brightness or warmth of a light or the soft feel of a blanket can become at best irritating and at worst torturous for people with autism. What most would consider a normal human environment is seen as a minefield of potential triggers to the autist. If we make the wrong step by saying or doing the wrong thing, our brain's perceptual systems can become violently overwhelmed with information, much like when a computer slows down due to an abundance of tabs or malware. 
However, unlike a computer which will revert to a blue screen of death or an automatic shutdown, the autistic brain cannot just shut up. It needs to let the pain run its course. Unfortunately, as this happens, the autistic person will cope using destructive methods like self-harm, violent exertion or screaming, and in rare cases, physical abuse towards others. If everything around you has the potential to overwhelm your senses, you become perpetually hyper-conscious of your surroundings. If you want to avoid any sensitivity, you have to plan out every word and action long in advance in order to avoid triggering that pain. For some people with autism, dealing with the neurotypical world can become so exhausting that you take on a life similar to a rodent. You don't like going outside, only leaving when you need to. You don't like interacting with that which is unfamiliar, and you are always on guard. If anything out of the ordinary happens, you retreat into your hole as fast as you can. This is why the symptoms of social awkwardness, social isolation, narrow interests, and a need for routine are synonymous with autism. It's a sad state of affairs one that most people with autism are victim to, and it is one that we'd like to transcend. But here we have a problem. Seeing that the majority of the world is neurotypical, it makes sense to construct our societies around the sensitivities of the average human being. To change one's normal behaviors to suit a small portion of the population can be unreasonable. Therefore, I don't think it's necessary, as some people do, to avoid things like clapping or changing the tone of one's voice in order to suit people like me. What I do think is reasonable is some basic level of understanding. When we react in a way that seems disproportionately negative to the offense committed, it's not due to some lack of character on our part. Our sensitivity was not born from an avoidance of adversity. In fact, it's from an abundance of it. If that simple fact can be accepted by the global population, autistic people will find it much easier to assimilate to the neurotypical world. Unfortunately, as it stands, there is still work to be done. I, along with many of my autistic brethren, still encounter that lack of understanding and support. It is part of the reason why I don't have any sort of social life, why I have trouble looking for work, why I don't go out of the house unless I have to. Some people just don't understand why autistic people, like I said before, are sensitive to simple things like light bulbs and blankets. If we truly are that sensitive, then maybe gradual exposure to the things we are sensitive to will help develop tolerance. The same way one builds up immunity to allergies or something. While I think that general exposure is healthy and useful to the autistic person, I can confidently say that, in most cases, the problem will maintain its intensity even if we learn to face it head on. Here, I'll use the example of blankets to explain what I mean. For several years, whenever I went to bed, I would toss and turn for at least two hours a night, trying to find a comfortable position to sleep in, rearranging my pillows, adding and subtracting blankets, and changing types of sheets. If a hair on my arm or my leg got tickled, or the comforter wasn't providing enough suppression to a part of my body, it cannot go unignored. I become an itching and scratching fiend. Even though I have found ways to deal with this problem, I still find myself bouncing around in bed due to the fabric of a blanket or its placement. To this day, I continue to worry about things like whether or not I'll be able to sleep in the same bed as my wife one day, or if she'll just get fed up with my tossing and turning. Comparatively speaking, however, this is one of the lesser examples of my sensitivity getting in the way of things. Allow me to describe to you what my first job was like when I worked as a dishwasher at a restaurant called East Side Mario's. A restaurant job is sufficiently fast-paced and stressful to the average person. For people like me, you have to take into consideration the violent clinking and clanking of the dishes. You have to deal with the intense temperatures in the kitchen. You have your co-workers trying to socialize with you, and when you reply, they're annoyed by the fact that you don't look them in the eye or you speak in a monotone, seemingly uninterested voice. Then you get mad at yourself, right? Because now they probably hate you. All those factors and more piled up, taking its toll on my mind and body. I did my best to keep this pain hidden from my family. I feared that if I were to quit the job on account of the neurological stress I was feeling, that my parents would chastise me for shirking responsibility. Worse yet, I believed that was true, that I was shirking responsibility. At the time, I didn't know I had autism. I just thought that 
I was weak. Despite my attempts to persevere, the pressure built to an unsustainable point. I remember breaking down in front of my mother one day when she was driving me to work. The anxiety, the pain, the feelings of shame, it was all mirrored on my face and in my voice. It was only then that my parents became convinced that the job legitimately was too stressful for me. In many cases, it is only when autistic people reach this breaking point where our agony is on full display that other people will believe us. However, there are times when even this won't be enough to convince the right people. I was lucky in this regard. Even though there was a time where my parents didn't understand, they eventually conceded that I was telling them the truth, and thankfully now they are more supportive than ever. But for a lot of people, no matter how bad their pain gets, it will never be recognized, nor adequately addressed. Believe me, I've talked with a lot of these people. I can't tell you how many times people have told me, Max, my friends and family never believed that I had autism until I showed them your videos. And in some cases, even after having watched my videos, their friends and family still won't believe them and will continue to chastise them. Then you have to consider the circumstances that are extremely unmanageable for the average person. What effect would that kind of pain have on the autistic brain. Think back to a time when you experienced true malevolence, betrayal, liars, people that got away with injustice. Think about how those things have affected your life, how you still think about those things to this day. The trauma that I've experienced from things that happened many years ago, those things come to my mind regularly, and it will always, always bring me to the cusp of a meltdown. The type of pain that I experience when reminiscing on these experiences is so poisonous, so teeming with hate, sadness, embarrassment, and because of that, I'll do anything and everything to prevent it. This is why I'm so antisocial, and it's why so many of my fellow autists are as well. They know what it's like to experience genuine, complete, crystalline pain because they have experienced it themselves. If isolation is what it takes to avoid it, then that's what they do. And it's sad because isolation is not a proper long-term solution. Neither is continuously living in fear of the outside world. People with autism deserve the ability to function in a society the same way everybody else does. We deserve to have functional friendships and relationships with other people without being in constant fear. We deserve to work hard at work worth doing, just like everybody else. That is why I am doing this video, to let my fellow autists know that they deserve to be happy for the pain they have suffered. They should be proud of the fact that they have lived through so much. Once you learn to take pride in that fact, you will discover a treasure trove of power within you. It is what got you to this point, and you will use that power to enrich your future. That's it for me, guys. Remember to give this video a like, because when you do, it tells the YouTube algorithm that this video and the other videos on my channel are worth watching. That will then help my videos show up in other people's recommended feeds, and who knows, this particular video might come at a time when somebody really needs it. If you're looking for more content like this, click on either of the two videos you see on screen now. Finally, make sure to follow me on Twitter, on Twitch, and join my Discord server where you can meet other differently wired people that want to meet you and support you. Links to all of that are in the description box below. Until next time, just remember as always, stay yellow.